Cognitive dysfunction is common among cancer patients. However, oncologists don't yet know enough about how to treat the condition or what causes it. Dr. Patricia Gantz and Dr. Lynn Wagner discussed the most recent studies in cognitive dysfunction at the 8th Annual Chicago Supportive Oncology Conference. Well, the question is actually partially what's causing it and who's at risk, and then secondarily, how do we treat it? Because I think we at this point in time aren't sure who's really at risk, what treatments cause these difficulties, how common they are. Uh, because many of the studies have wide ranges of incidents from a few percent to almost everyone. So I think uh, it's still a very controversial area. I don't know what Lynn Lynn feels, but that's kind of the way I look at it. Sure, yeah, I agree. I I think that we're still figuring out who is at risk uh, for cognitive problems. We know uh, that that for most patients, the cognitive changes uh, during and after treatment tend, after treatment mostly tend to be pretty small in magnitude. Um, There are a subgroup of patients who seem to be at risk for more profound and more lasting deficits and we're not entirely sure yet who those patients are and why this is occurring and that of course answering that key question will drive treatment. And I think understanding the mechanisms by which this occurs allows you to then uh, propose some treatments. Um, But I, I will be talking a little bit about some treatments that have been tried and it's not that people are ignoring it. I think at the same time Uh, that patients are experiencing this and complaining about these things, we have to go ahead and try and intervene. Patients will have often a constellation of symptoms during treatment, which would include fatigue, insomnia, cognitive complaints, uh, and also sometimes depression. And so all of those may co-occur but they may have different manifestations. So some patients may be more fatigued and have a little bit of cognitive complaints. Others may be you know, very disrupted in terms of their memory and, and attending to things uh, and a little bit of fatigue. So it's kind of a mixture and at least some of the work that we're doing um, suggests there's a biological underpinning to some of these symptoms that come occur. Um, most of the symptoms do get better. And again, much of the study has been done in patients with breast cancer. That's where we have the most information, but we see it in other diseases. And it tends to be more intensively treated patients, although we do see patients who just may have one, maybe surgery and radiation alone and no chemotherapy Mm -hmm. and still have these complaints. So it's quite variable. Some of the things that we have looked at uh, relate to genetic susceptibility, um, single nucleotide polymorphisms in uh, different genes that may control inflammation may be associated with having uh, some of these ongoing symptoms. So the personal vulnerability is an issue because you can treat 100 patients with exactly the same regimen and only a few will have this uh, particular problem. There are a couple of strategies that, that we've used in research to identify patients who are experiencing cognitive problems. One strategy is neuropsychological testing, uh, neuropsych assessment, uh, to identify patients who demonstrate impairments. Uh, Another approach uh, where my work is focused uh, is asking patients uh, using standardized patient reported outcomes measures to report when they have problems. So that's another way that uh, is feasible in clinical practice to identify patients who are uh, experiencing cognitive problems and who are distressed by these problems. And I really agree with uh, Dr. Gant's point on our uh, need to better understand the underlying mechanism. I think as that science is evolving, we can advise our patients to engage in uh, lifestyle uh, behaviors that will promote their well-being, such as exercise. I think we see some encouraging research in non-cancer populations uh, indicating that exercise may help to sharpen one's cognitive skills. Uh, I know there are trials underway in cancer looking at Uh, exercise and and fatigue, uh, that exercise is very helpful for fatigue in our patients, which we can then anticipate will bolster their cognitive function. So I think that that's a a good strategy we can employ right now with our patients. It's just good sense uh, while we're sorting out the science. I also am uh, encouraged by studies looking at cognitive behavior therapy in managing uh, cognitive dysfunction and uh, we can teach our patients you know it, while it may be unavoidable to experience the side effect we can teach them ways to manage the stress and anxiety that they encounter when they experience cognitive failures that can help to reduce their distress and the functional impairments associated with the symptom. Yeah, we, we are actually doing a randomized trial we did a pilot that are doing a randomized trial now 
looking at a cognitive rehabilitation intervention. It's five weeks, group meetings. It's adapted from what's been done with older adults who have memory uh, difficulties, but tailored to the needs of breast cancer patients in this mm -hmm. case. And they get very specific exercise. They get organizational skills, planning skills. Um, and uh, as Dr. Wagner said, a lot of this is kind of the frustration and anxiety associated with trying to do too much sometimes and sometimes breaking down these tasks into smaller ones, um, taking rests in between when they're doing things. Um, so learning skills to manage um, their difficulties. What we've actually found in terms of working with um, a large number of these women is many of them were not well organized and good planners before they got cancer. And then with the subtle changes that may occur with the cancer treatment, they really go off kilter. Um, some of them are people who were, you know, very good multitaskers and, you know, then have, can't quite do as much. So it's a variable.